Listen to me, man. You have a great life in front of you. But your great life is in front of you. It's not behind you. What you did back there ain't got nothing to do with what God got for you. What you did back there was learn the lessons to get you to where you are at this particular moment right here. You can't drive your car looking in the rearview mirror. You can't. If you keep looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to keep crashing your car. There's a reason why the rearview mirror is this big and the windshield is this big. That's a reason for it. Because all the rearview mirror does is allows you to see what you've passed and to prevent what you've passed from coming up on you again. That's all the rearview mirror is for. The windshield is your future. It's where you're going. It's where you're headed. I hope you all picked up this today. And think about that, how that affects your life. If you got someone who you feel has wronged you and you carrying that, that's like a cancer. And all it's doing is eating away at you. Do you know how many people I've had to forgive that have never asked me for forgiveness? You know how many people I just let go so I could just go where God had for me? Because I just ain't have no more time to spend no more time thinking about that. Let that be a lesson to you. Look, man, if you got something that's been bothering you in your life, get past it. See, if God wakes you up in the morning, it's a sign from God that he ain't through with you yet. That's why he wakes you up. When he's done with you, you won't wake up no more. But as long as he got something for you, he keeps waking you up. Why don't you wake up to go see what that is? He done got you past whatever it was. Whatever it was that's been on you, he done really brought you through it because he keeps waking, you're done. Don't, 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 don't lay, that, don't lay that wallowing in your past, man. Your past is back there. I would rather show the world what love do through forgiveness than sit up in here and win a damn argument. We, to a great extent, behave, think, react because of some previous experience that we've had. One of the things that we know about life is that it is always changing. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes things go real well, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes you're happy, and sometimes you're sad. Now that's that thing called life. And when we begin to understand and know that, accepting that reality that, that we will never ever have things just on an even kill all the time, that you're going to have some ups and you're going to have some downs. But during those down moments, that's where the growth takes place. That's where the work is. See, anybody can feel good when they have their health, their bills are paid, they have happy relationships, the children are acting normal, <laughs> business is successful. Anybody could be positive then. Anybody can have a larger vision then. Anybody can have faith under those kinds of circumstances. Am I correct? Yes. See, but the real challenge, the real challenge of growth mentally, emotionally, and spiritually comes when you get knocked down. Somebody said that, that adversity introduces a man to himself or a woman. How you handle it. That's where the growth takes place. You have to take the hand you've been dealt and make the most of it. Nothing that's happened to you has stopped your destiny. That person that did you wrong, they walked away. It may have been painful, but they didn't ruin your life. They don't have that much power. If they could stop God's plan, they would be bigger than God. Don't let one bad break, one injustice, one difficult season cause you to be sour have a chip on your shoulder. When my father went to be with the Lord, I lost my best friend. I had worked with him day in and day out for 17 years. We traveled the world together. Suddenly he was gone. I was tempted to thank God, where are you? This isn't fair. Why did this happen? When we go through loss, things we don't understand, 
that victim mentality will always come knocking at the door. We have to make the choice. Are we going to live bitter, discouraged, thinking we're a victim of our circumstances? We're a victim of the loss, a victim of this unfair boss, a victim of this pandemic. Or are we going to believe that God is in control, that he's ordering our steps, that his plans for us are for good? Instead of having a victim mentality, switch over to a victor mentality. There's hope in our hearts and giving up is not an option. You and I and we, no matter what your unique situation, your storm, your struggle, your trauma, your abuse, your wounds, your scars, no matter what they are, and I know we've all got them on some way, some way, somehow, some level, whatever they are, I promise you this, you are not a product of your past, you are not a product of your environment or your current unique situation, but you are always a product of how do we navigate through our storm. What we do is what we believe. And in that moment, instead of giving up, I literally wrote the words, change the world. Literally, I wrote these words, change the world. And I slapped them and I put them on the prison wall in my cell. And I began to realize something. First and foremost, the mask that I wore that was supposed to keep me safe, it was the very thing that held me hostage and paralyzed me. And I, I wore the mask and I tried to protect and I isolated and isolating and letting nobody in. It got me to a place of brokenness. And I decided in that moment, I was done wearing that stupid mask. I was done being afraid of showing people my scars, my hurts, my pains, my wounds. And yet that's a fearful thing because I don't know what others are going to do with when I begin to talk and to communicate. But I realized what was going to happen if I continue to wear the mask, man. Nothing ever changes unless we change. The mask doesn't keep you safe. It, it holds you hostage, y'all. Huh? But you know what I also had to realize? I was allowing things that I couldn't control to control me. You see, growing up, I blamed everything on my dad. I blamed everything on him. He was the reason that I skipped school. He was the reason for my attitude. He was the reason that I, I, I went to drugs. He was the reason for my suicidal thoughts. He was the reason for every destructive behavior. Like I blamed everything on him being ripped out of my life. But you know what I had did? I had walked into this trap. I was allowing things that I couldn't control. Those situations that you didn't sign up for, you didn't want to have to deal with. It knocked, it came in front of you. And I allowed that thing that I had no say over, I allowed that to to control me for so long. I was allowing things that I couldn't control to control me. And I had to realize I had to take control of what I can only control. I can't control what you think, what you say, or how you treat me. I can't always control the situations, the struggles, the adversities, the abuses, the hurts, the pains that other have caused me, but I can always re I can always control how I react, how I respond, and what I do. I had to take control of me, control what you can control. And truthfully, the first thing that I had to do, which was the most difficult thing that I had to do, I had to realize the anger, the rage, the hurt, the frustration, the pain that I had towards my dad, I had to let it go. And I was scared to let it go because I had had so much identity tied up in my wounds, but I had to learn I am more than my struggle. I am more than my wound. I have to let it go. Letting it go and forgiving him didn't justify it, didn't make it right for him. But if a family could forgive me for taking the life of their daughter, how could I continue to understand this, that the anger, the frustration, the madness, the pain that I had towards my dad, it was only poisoning me. And I had to let some things go. And that's a challenge. Because for so long, that pain, that wound, it really became like a safety net for me because it was my go-to. It was my reason for all of my struggles. And if I let it go, then I had to begin to face some of my other hurts and my pains. And that's intimidating and it's scary. But the truth is, when we hold on to these things, it's not poisoning the people who did it to us. It's only holding you hostage. And so, I let it go. It didn't justify it. It doesn't make it okay. It doesn't mean that me and my dad became best of best of buddies, but it allowed me to begin to continue 
to pursue purpose. And we all got a purpose. Every one of you in this room, you were born to leave your fingerprints on history. Every one of you in this room were born to not just exist, but to experience life. But until you let go of some of the things that you've allowed to define you for so long, you know why? Sometimes we can't change and we can't overcome the suicidal thoughts, the self-injuring mentality, our anger, our rage, our wounds, because all you have been doing for so long, you're consumed by it. All you do is focus on it. It's everything about you and what you feed and what you focus on, what you feed grows and what you focus on magnifies. And I realized if I stopped being consumed about that, but found the courage to let it go and stop being self-absorbed, but begin to walk, even while I was still wounded, begin to move towards my dream. And I realized what I give away, I get to keep. And I started looking to my friends, my peers, my community of other people with storms and struggles. And I began to recognize what gave me real worth, real passion. What helped me really overcome is this giving what you give away, you get to keep. When I started having empathy towards my friends, being of somebody that would listen, getting involved in other people's situations and helping them. Why does that help me? Because it took my eyes off my struggle and it put my eyes on beginning to help others. And when I helped others, it gave me real self-worth, real self-value. That bad break is not how your story ends. The loss, the sickness, the injustice is not going to limit the rest of your life. God said in Isaiah, he will pay you back double for the unfair things that have happened. If you're going to see the double, you have to know that God is going to make it up to you. It may be unfair, but God is a just God. He saw what happened. He knows who hurt you, what you lost, what you're struggling with. He's not going to just bring you out. He's going to bring you out better. Get rid of that victim mentality. Quit dwelling on who hurt you, what you lost. You're not a victim. God always causes you to triumph. That bad break wasn't fair. You didn't like it, but what you can't see is it set you up for double. That boss that overlooked you, you didn't get the credit. You could feel like a victim. No, get ready. God's going to make it up to you. That set you up for promotion, increase, favor that you wouldn't have seen if that had not have happened. And here's the key. Nobody can make you be a victim. They can do things that are not fair. You can go through things you don't like, you don't understand, but none of that can force you to have a victim mentality. You have to give permission to become a victim. You have to make that choice. I'm at a disadvantage. This bad break has stopped my future. I'm asking you to not give permission. Victory starts in your thinking. As long as you feel like a victim, it's going to limit your destiny. You won't pray bold prayers. You won't believe for big dreams. You won't expect God's favor. No matter what's happened in your past, no matter how many generations there's been dysfunction, abuse, lack, struggle, you're the generation that's going to set a new standard. You're the one that's going to see this shift in your thinking. We're not slaves. We're not victims, limited, at a disadvantage. We are children of the Most High God. No more forever the victim. No more I always get bad breaks. It's just my luck. No more my family has always struggled. It's just who we are. God is doing a new thing. Now do your part and put on those new clothes, so to speak. See yourself differently. Have a new perspective. You're not a victim of your past, a victim of who went before you, a victim of what didn't work out. You are a victor. God is about to release freedom, wholeness, abundance, favor like you've never seen. You've been raised up for such a time as this to make a difference, to take your family to a new level. The day that you start living your life according to everybody else's opinion is the beginning of the end. Most of y'all 
don't actually know your self-worth. You don't know your self-value. So you're like a vulnerable little child. You're shaking and it's like, everybody loves me this week. So I love me this week. Next week, it drops. So now you're running around insecure and not loving yourself, sad and depressed based on the feedback, the responses and the energy that the rest of the world is giving you. But have you ever considered the reason why you're going in circles is because you never stopped to consider, have I ever checked my circle? Someone say, check your circle. I love me. So the day that you decide to stop loving me, I'm not going to love myself any less. I believe in me. If you stop believing in me, I'm not going to believe in myself any less. If you believe that I'm irrelevant, because you think or believe that about me, it doesn't mean that I'm going to believe it about myself. A person of character doesn't care if you discover their private life. If you are afraid that I may find out about your private life, you have no character. You are a character. The day that you allow the opinions of the outside world to dictate the way you feel about yourself, it is the beginning of the end of you living a blessed and self-loving, secure life. Friend, listen to me loud and clear. Do not pick your friends that are enabling you. Pick some friends who empower you. Love yourself. Believe in yourself. Independent of the validation of the world. Have opinions and feelings about yourself. Independent of the feedback. Why you got to have somebody calling you beautiful every day in order for you to feel beautiful? Do you believe that you're beautiful? Or do you only believe you're beautiful when other people say that you're beautiful? Self-love is the cure to self-hate. A truly courageous person is not afraid of what might or might not happen next week or next year. He fears not making the most of every moment today. A truly courageous person fears making appearances more important than realities making impressions more important than communication. Think about something that you'd like to have or something you'd like to create for you or your family. Why don't you hold this thought in mind? Now, one of the first things I want you to do is don't worry about the inner conversation that you're going to have. Don't worry about how you're going to do it. That's going to come. You're going to develop a plan of action. You will find the way. You'll become the kind of person that can attract the people, the resources, in order to make that become reality. The discipline can seem like it's your worst enemy. But the reality is, discipline is your best friend and it'll put you on that path. The path to strength and intelligence and happiness. What is the vision for your life? What are the ideas and the dreams for your life? Who are you? What are your gifts and talents? What is your ultimate destiny and your goals? God will never give you something somebody else is supposed to have. Negativity, you can protect yourself from negativity. And that's what stops most people, negative thoughts. You can coat your mind from negativity. It's a real simple exercise to do. I do it every morning before I walk out the door. So I walk out as a positive person. The way you can put a coating around your mind is with one simple thing, gratitude. Passion gives us a great amount of energy. And when we have that passion, there's something about how we love what we're doing and we enjoy what we're doing. And passion energizes us. It's possible to be passionate about something that you're not gifted in. Hello, let me explain. Have you ever watched the tryouts at an American Idol? We can see that most people aren't as successful as they wish they were. Do you see there's a connection between these two very common phenomena? I hope you'll understand that it's in your best interests to take responsibility for everything you do. You spend your life performing for a crowd, it'll kill you. And you're like, I'm good. I'm not a singer. I don't perform for people. It's gotten much deeper than that now. It's the feeling that we get when we start offering ourselves up in a form 
that is more impressive to people but is not authentic to us. See, when you're going someplace and you already know how much you're going to make, you already know how far you can go, you're in a dead-end position. It erodes your self-esteem. It lowers your sense of yourself. It creates an emptiness in you. So I say that your life is worth finding. Don't be so obsessed with them. Be obsessed with your own reality TV program called Your Own Life, right? How about the news? All the time they're trying to distract us. I'm not saying don't know about them, but it's such a convenient escape from the work. What it takes to win is not worrying about all that stuff. That should be the background noise. How do we increase our self-esteem? You have to begin to fortify yourself. I believe that you have to begin to consciously monitor your inner conversation and start talking to yourself. Start building yourself up. Sometimes the only good things you will hear about you are the things that you say to you. It's something in me that says, I need to do this. So that's the first voice. But we've trained ourselves to ignore this voice and listen to the second voice that I believe is a collection of the average society. It's what we learned. It's the practical voice, the should voice. Whenever you say I should do, where are you getting that from? What society says. Well, we forget society's kind of crazy. It's like, why are we using them as the, the bellwether that we should get our advice from, right? 52 is the age at which a man's philosophy is fully formed. But it's okay to run a little behind schedule as long as you recognize it and do something about it. And you don't need volumes of books or the library in order to create a personal philosophy. You can do that anywhere. You can do it right here. So this first voice goes, I think we should do this. And we go right to this voice that says why we shouldn't. So for instance, there's many people that feel guilty about something. If you actually go to your heart, you can understand at a true level why you could have done something like that. Everyone can. But what causes our pain is trying to get society to understand why we did something. But the collective society isn't at a consciousness where they've forgiven themselves for anything. So there's a lot of judgment you'll look at in yourself if you look at yourself through society's eyes. Success is not in short supply. It isn't rationed, and you stepped up to the window and it was all gone. No, no, no. It's like an ocean here. Now, if that's true, what's the problem? Well, some people go to the ocean with a teaspoon. Have you got the picture? See, what you want to do in view of the size of the ocean is trade your teaspoon for at least a bucket and you'll look better down at the ocean. Kids won't make fun of you, right? Okay, now there's two ways to ask and we'll wrap up goal setting, two ways. Here's number one, ask with intelligence. It didn't say ask intelligently, but I'm sure it meant that. Don't mumble, you don't get anything by mumbling. Be clear, be specific. Intelligent asking means how wide, how high, how soon, when, what size, what color, how much. Define what you want and describe what you want. That's powerful. In the weekend seminar we teach, goals become like a magnet. They pull you that direction. And the better you describe them, the more they pull. So ask intelligently. Here's number two. Ask with faith. That's the childish part of the equation. Believe you can get what you want like a child. Not an adult. Adults are too skeptical. So the formula really reads, make plans like an adult, and believe in them like a child. And the most incredible things will happen. Just try it for 90 days. Just try it. You can always go back to the old ways. Just try it, just 90 days, 90 days. Now here's the last qualifying phrase on goal setting, as we promised to qualify everything. And it simply goes like this. Remember, you won't get everything you want. 
And we've already studied the reason for that. Simply, sometimes it hails on your crop and rains on your parade. It's that kind of planet. So you won't get everything you want, but if you will work this goal setting formula, you can get plenty for wealth and happiness. Now, let me give you a little simple formula for goal setting, okay? We take two, two and a half hours on the weekend for the whole 10 year plan. We don't have time for that tonight, but let me get you started with a little simple formula Mr. Shof gave me, and maybe this will be helpful. First of all, I've divided goals into two parts. First is long range. Long range goals, that's your dreams. Your dreams for the next three, five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, actually the rest of your life. Your dreams, you've got to keep dreaming. Ronald Reagan, president said to the joint session of Congress a few weeks ago, the Republic is a dream. And if we don't keep dreaming, we will lose the Republic. Your better future is a dream for yourself and for your family. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? You've got to dream dreams. There's a Bible phrase that says, without dreams and visions, people perish. You've got to have something to go for that inspires the heart and the soul. The truth will set you free. The truth will stand and the truth will deliver you from procrastination and laziness and the downward spiral that comes with a lack of discipline. Character is the dedication to a set of standards. What are your standards that you've set for your life? I will never violate my standards. You got to say that every day. I do not tell lies. That's a standard. So don't believe the lies. Believe the truth. And the truth is you have time. You have the skill. You have the knowledge and the discipline to get it done. Yet in life, outside of that one area, most of us are worried about suffering. We're afraid of it. it. When we're suffering and sacrificing, we wonder whether it's worth it. We wonder whether we're supposed to. We wonder whether sacrifice or setbacks or suffering is a sign it's not our real dream, don't we? If you really want to develop the power of positive thinking as a habit, as a lifestyle, as a strategy for success, then decide right now to find something to appreciate from any seemingly negative person or situation and develop the habit of giving compliments. See, at the gym, you never think, oh, I'm going through some pain and discomfort. This must be a sign I shouldn't be at the gym. You'd never think that. It goes with the territory. Everyone knows this. Build a bicep or a tricep or a chest or legs. You have to break it down, suffer and sacrifice for it to grow. The indication of the pain and sacrifice and sweat, don't you feel better at the gym? So in that area, we all know to the extent we suffer and sacrifice is to the extent we grow. And your body is a metaphor for the rest of your life. See, if you really want to have some more positive feelings in your life, you got to keep focusing on what's right. You got to get curious. And most importantly, you got to find something to appreciate even in the tough times. Because in reality, as we've talked about so often before, the toughest times in your life sometimes provide you with the real resources to change your life. That peace that we're after lies somewhere beyond personality, beyond the perception of others, beyond invention and disguise. Your need for acceptance can make you invisible in this world. Don't let anything stand in the way of the light that shines through this form. What's the one thing that keeps you from becoming who God made you to be? What's the one thing that keeps you from using your shape? Write it down, fear. That's the word, it's fear. It scares you to become somebody that you, other people may not understand. Risk being seen in all of your glory. Our eyes are not viewers. They're also projectors that are running a second story over the picture that we see in front of us all the time. Fear is writing that script and the working title is I'll never be enough. And when I say life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. I'm just making a conscious choice to perceive challenges as something beneficial so that I can deal with them in the most productive way. You'll come up with your own style. That's part of the fun. If you make it to the end of this video, I want you to write, self-love is the cure to self-hate. These are the type of qualities that I'm going and have been instilling in my daughter.
Nobody wants to be alone. But if you show up empty as an empty shell and you're expecting this man to fulfill you because as soon as he leaves, you're depleted, you're empty and you have nothing left for yourself again. Never rely or depend on anybody to fulfill your heart. You've got to dream. Don't lose your dreams for yourself, for your future, for your family. The dreams of love and enterprise and travel and doing things, becoming something unique on your journey here. Don't lose your dreams. Do some dreaming. That's long range goals. You've got to have those. So that's number one. Here's the second part of goals, short range. Short range goals, that's your goals for tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, the immediate future. We call these confidence builders. Because if you set up something short range, go for it, get it, latch, latch onto it, work hard, accomplish it. That starts building your strong feelings to go for your dreams. Now I've divided goals into three categories, here they are. Number one is economic. That's your goals for money, income, business, profits, production. Economics. Make sure you've got your economics well planned. Economics plays a major role in everybody's life. Economics is major, which means it ought to be meticulously well planned for tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, long range. What if you ask somebody tomorrow if you could see their meticulously well-planned list of economic goals? What would they probably say? They say, you some kind of a nut? You must be weird. Hey, I found out what success is. Success is doing what the failures won't do. Make sure you've got your economics well-planned. It'll put you in the top 5%. One of the key little subjects we talk about on the weekend is the seven fundamentals for wealth and happiness. And that's one of them, well-planned economics. It's a fundamental if you want to do well. Join the top 5%. Anybody in this room can join the top 5%, if you will. Now here's the second category of goals, things. Make a list of the things you want. And on my list of things, now I put everything. Little things as well as major things. Doesn't matter how small it is, it goes on my list. I used to just put major things, cars, homes. I don't do that anymore. I now load my list with everything, everything. And the reason is part of the fun of having a list is checking it off. That's it. Boy, at the end of the day, if you can go, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Whatever it is, right? You get into the habit. So load up your list, the things you want. Now, when you check off something major, celebrate. That's an important point to me. Celebrate your achievements. Live it up, have a party. When you reach something you've worked for for a while. See, we all grow from two experiences. One is called the pain of losing. The other one is called the joy of winning. We need both of them. Amplify them as much as you can, which also means make losing painful. If you set up something, fooled around, didn't get it, put it on yourself. On the other side, if you did get it, congratulate yourself. Self-congratulations is a sign of maturity. Seeking congratulations is a sign of immaturity. But hey, winning and losing, see, that's what it's all about. That's the name of the game. Now, some people lead such mediocre lives. At the end of the day, they don't know whether they're winning or losing. They got no clue. Guy's just going through the day with his fingers crossed. There's a better way. Okay, here's the third category of goals. Personal development. Put those goals together, personal development goals. That's your goals to be stronger, more decisive, be a speaker, be a leader, learn a language, all kinds of skills. Okay. The whole weekend seminar was designed to improve all your skills so that you walk away more skillful. And that's what you want, the personal development skills. That's what attracts, that's what brings good things to your life, the person you become more skillful. 
Now this is quite a package to work on. Economics, things, personal development. For tomorrow, this week, this month, this year, long range. Okay, that'll get you started. Now here's the simple formula for setting goals. It goes like this. A, work on your goals. That's step one, work on them. And I put the word work there deliberately. Setting goals is plain hard work. I don't want to kid you. We haven't come here tonight to kid each other. It's work. I know it's work. That's why a lot of people just let it slide. It's work. Many people work hard on their job, but they don't work hard on their future. They just let that slide. And the work involved is making plans. I know most people don't. I understand that. But don't let that be you. Guy says, well, yeah, you work where I work. By the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to eat a bite of supper, watch a little TV, get to bed. You can't sit up half the night. Plan, plan, plan. And the guys be Good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you've got to be better than sincere, working hard. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good planner. Somebody once wisely said, the people who fail to plan are planning to fail. Well said. So work on your goals. Here's step two. Write your goals down. That's so important. I teach my staff around the world, put your goals in your journal. Because one of the major people you want to study is yourself. So here's the list of goals I put together three weeks ago. Here's the list of goals I put together two years ago. Here's some of the changes I made, rearrangement of my priorities. I scratched these off, I put these on, I've gotten these. Study your accomplishments, study what your desires are. Put them on paper, write them down. Here's another reason for writing your goals down. It shows you're serious about doing better. And to do better, you gotta get serious. You don't have to be grim, but you must be serious. Credit goes to our awesome patrons who make videos like this one possible. Consider joining them to support our work. You can also support us by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell button to get notified when our new videos are released. And as always, thank you for watching. I was with a friend who went to the hospital one day. Grandmother was dying. He kept calling, my dear, my dear, I love you. And she said, I'm not going to make it. But I called you down here because I want to ask you something. Do you know your great-grandfather's name? He said, no, my dear, I don't. She said, you know why? She said, because he didn't leave you nothing. She said, I want you to go away from here. And I want you to live your life so that your children's grandchildren will know your name. And when I heard that, it changed me. I said, wow, I'm going to start living my life so that my grandkids' kids know my name. Then I've accomplished the deal. You look at your life. You look at what you produce. Is it giving you what you want? Are you living on purpose? Are you living your dream? Are you acting on your ideas? Are you procrastinating? Are you evading your own greatness? Is your life an adventure or is it boring? See, a lot of people go to work every day miserable and all they do is just talk about how miserable they are. You've got to find ways to increase your sense of self-appreciation because if you don't, you will find yourself 
unconsciously engage in self-destructive behavior. If you don't program yourself, life will program you. You gotta run. You gotta run. You can't just wake up in the morning and let me see what's gonna happen today. Ah, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know where I'm gonna go. I just woke up. Oh, you should stay in the bed. Give the day to somebody who has a plan because success is never an accident. And if you don't want it, get out of my way. Because there are some people who want to do something with their life who will run. God has put gifts and talents in you. You have something to offer that nobody else has. But it's easy to let fear hold us back. What if I try and it doesn't happen? What if people don't accept me? Too often, we're letting the what ifs talk us out of it. My message today is very simple. Quit hiding what God has given you. When God breathed his life into you, he lit your candle. He created you to shine, to make a difference, to leave your mark. We need your talent. We need your creativity. We need your smile. You can't play it safe your whole life and become who you were created to be. You can't wait till the fear goes away and then you'll do it. When I get my courage up, then I'll teach that class. Then I'll start my business. Then I'll go out on that date. You're going to have to do it in spite of the fear. I feel afraid, but fear is not going to control my life. I'm going to take a step of faith. No one that's ever done anything great in life has done it without fear. They felt the fear, but they did it afraid. It's now or never. You either take that step of faith or that moment will not pass by again. When you're close to releasing your gift, you will feel fear more than ever. That's the enemy trying to deceive you into keeping your gift hidden. He doesn't want you to go where no one in your family has gone. He'll work overtime to try to convince you to shrink back, play it safe. Well, what if I fail? You get up and try again. Every failure is preparing you. You will learn more through failure than you will through success. You can't be so afraid of failure that you won't get out of your comfort zone. Even if it doesn't work out, you're learning. You're one step closer to seeing it happen. When we come to the end of life, nothing will be more disappointing than to think what would have happened if I would have taken that step of faith. Where would I be if I wouldn't have hid my gifts? hid my talents, hid my creativity. Friends, life is short. Don't let the fear of people, the fear of failure, the fear of being criticized hold you back. I don't want people talking badly about me. Can I tell you, respectfully, somebody's talking about you right now. Somebody is jealous of your success. People are going to talk whether you settle or whether you stretch. You might as well stretch and pursue what God put in your heart. What they say doesn't determine who you are. Every person has negative chatter. Tune it out. Quit letting it upset you. God hears what they're saying. He'll fight your battles. He'll be your vindicator. Everyone is not supposed to be for you. You can't reach your destiny without opposition. Joseph would have never taken the throne without his brothers throwing him into a pit. David would have never become king without Goliath. Some enemies are designed as a part of your destiny. They're not going to stop you, they're going to promote you. Keep running your race, not looking to the left nor to the right. Other people may not be able to see your gifts. They don't know what God's put in you. Don't let the fear of what they think hold you back. You're not going to give an account to people of what you did with your life. We're going to give an account to God. You can talk yourself into your dreams or you can talk yourself out of your dreams. Quit telling yourself that you can't do it. You don't have the training. Get rid of those excuses and start telling yourself what God says about you. You are strong. You are blessed, you are favored, you have been fearfully and wonderfully made.
I wouldn't be standing here if I had not learned to step out even though I felt afraid. What are you hiding? Your gifts? Your personality? It's time to let your light shine. Quit hiding your smile. Brighten our day. Quit hiding your encouragement. Lift somebody up. If you can write, start writing. If you can build, start building. That gift was not meant to stay hidden. It's not doing you any good, nor is it doing us any good, as long as you keep it to yourself. The wealthiest place on earth is in the graveyards. Buried in those graves are hidden dreams, books that were never written, businesses never started, inventions never invented. I'm asking you to release what you have. God didn't give you that dream so that it could stay buried. We have a responsibility. God has entrusted us with gifts and talents. Don't live passively, just taking whatever life brings you away. Shake off the complacency and get focused. Where could you be at this time next year if you got rid of the distractions and you put all your effort into the main thing God put in your heart? You can do many things good but you can't do many things great. Find that one thing and excel at it. Focus on your one thing and do it to the best of your ability. Jesus told a parable about a businessman that was going on a trip. He called three employees over. He gave one five talents, another two talents, and the third one talent. The man with five talents went out and invested his and gained five more. The man with two gained two more. But the man with one talent was afraid. What if the economy goes down? What if somebody steals it from me? So he went and buried his talent in the ground. You'll never increase as long as you're living fear-based. Fear of people, fear of what could happen. All three men had the same opportunity. Two did something with their gifts. The third, he played it safe and buried it. The owner came back. The man with the five talents said, here are the five you gave me, plus five more I gained. The man with the two, here are the original two, plus two more. Again, well done. The third man came up and said, sir, I didn't want to lose what you gave me, so I hid my talent. Here's the one back that you gave me. The owner was expecting a profit. It wasn't acceptable to just give back what was given. He was expecting increase. He was angry. He took that talent and gave it to the man that had five. It's interesting. The man didn't lie. He didn't cheat. He didn't kill somebody. He didn't have an affair. What, what did he do? He hid what God gave him. You and I have been given gifts. God has entrusted us with them. Like that owner, we're going to see him. He's going to ask, what did you do with the talents I gave you? God has given us all different abilities. We're not competing with each other. You don't have to keep up with your neighbor. What matters is, what are you doing with what you have? Have you buried it? Or are you living faith-based? Growing, stretching, increasing, looking for opportunities, believing you have seeds of greatness. Are you burying what you should be showing and showing what you should be burying? Why don't you start burying the insecurity, burying the doubt, burying what the critics have said and start showing your talent? If you will bury the fear and show your faith, you'll see increase. You'll see new levels. So here's one of the key expressions of the evening. Take a new inventory of yourself. And make sure that all of your talent and ability and mentality and ingenuity and vitality and strong feelings, courage, make sure that all you've got is being used. Otherwise, you lose.